to our, um, hold on a second. I guess this is our, uh, we are, we're setting it up for Facebook. So we should be Facebook live. Yes, sir. We're good. Y'all see? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Only thing about it is, what happened to my? Okay, so we're we're back uh, for our, what's this? Our third, fourth edition, Joseph, of the parenting and the pandemic. One. Third one, right? Yes, sir. It's third. Yes, yeah, sir. It, it, it's been awesome, man. And I think uh, the most, the most, the the, the most awesomer think about this, and I don't know if that's a word, but if it's not, then I know I'm on the phone. I mean, I'm on live with a, uh, a lot of intelligent therapists and psychologists and, 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 and clinicians and all this. But hey, listen, so what we want to do is we have to be very, very consistent in uh, talking about some different techniques and, and things that's working because we're still in the pandemic. You know, you probably can't tell in Atlanta late on a Saturday evening or a Friday night, but we are still in the pandemic. Uh, kids are still going to school virtual. And so we are in, 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 in need of some parenting tips. So uh, Kina, I want to start with you since I pronounced your name right. Um, you have a teenager or preteen that, that you have been, uh, I, I don't know if he's in person in school, if he's at home, but how is this coming? How is this coming with you? We can't, can't hear. You. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. There you go. I'm sorry. So far, it's been a little challenging with doing the work-life balance. But to be honest, I don't know how I'm managing it. I'm just getting it done. It has to get done. I have no room to sit and contemplate, only execute, that's it. So, so this is what I wanna do. I wanna ask this question to uh, my Serenity Community Services family. And um, before we get into that, Joseph, you wanna give us a quick overview of who Serenity is and uh, all these awesome people that's on the call, man, and where you are located and the great work that you have been doing in the community for many, many years. Yes, sir. Um, so. Good afternoon, everybody. Like Coach Davis just said, my name is Joseph Wright and I represent Serenity Community Services. If you see me around Next Level, you probably think that I, rep I represent both. I take off my Next Level hat, put on my Serenity hat, take my Serenity hat, put my Next Level hat back on. But uh, Serenity Community Services is a mental and behavioral health agency located uh, based out of Union, Union City, Georgia. We are a non-intensive outpatient service provider. Uh, that was established in 2009. So we've been providing these these services in our community for the last 12 years. Um, as Coach was saying, the, well, I think Coach was saying as the, uh, the whole purpose behind this call or the reason why we came up with trying to put this resource out to the community is because me and Coach was talking one day and we were just recognizing how, uh, how much of a, how this new norm is affecting all of us, right? You know, we're dealing with new triggers, new stressors, things that we have never experienced before in our lives. This is a global pandemic. This is the first time this has happened. You know, we got kids going back into school. You might have a family member who's been affected by COVID. So there's a multitude of different things that, that we just felt like we might can address if we just put some, put a, a different resource out in the community. So we just came up with the idea to have this once a month call and it's, you know, just try to provide another resource to the community. Uh, thank you for that, Joseph. Um, and let, let's just go ahead and, and, and jump right in it. We have um, been given a um, proposition from the general that we should end this call in one hour. So uh, we're going to grant Ms. Ponder Wright. We're going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm a son of a preacher, so we have three benedictions. So I'll make sure that I start my first benediction at 6:45, and our final benediction will be at seven o'clock. Amen. So. Um, let, let me let me ask this. Um, I, I want Serenity to help uh, Kina out with the thousands of people that's watching this on, on Facebook, Serenity. Um, Kina, I know one of the things that you're challenged with the most is how are how are your son 
going to be able to come out of this pandemic and go back into a school setting and still have interest in school, right? Is that one of your concerns? Because I am learning and hearing, getting multiple phone calls every day about kids who are just not interested in school anymore. Um, so we all know that this pandemic is going to end uh, once all the vaccines are, are, are paid for and all that, but that's a whole nother subject. So Kina, how, how, do you have a plan in place or is that, is that something we want to uh, ask Serenity as to some of the, the things that you may say to your son to, to encourage him to want to be back in school? Um, so I have a twofold answer for that. So the first fold is um, uh, my youngest son, Wesley, the one that you've all met, he really didn't see a value in school when he was going in. He really felt like, listen, I want to make money. I want to start a business and school is not going to teach me to do it. So it was already an uphill battle to get him to go to school anyway. But then when he became a virtual student, he's like, okay, so now I still have to do this. But now I just don't have to be amongst other people. I'm okay with that. I can free up more of my time to do whatever it is that he want to do that he finds interesting outside of technology, Legos specifically. Um, so I think the challenge that's going to come with Wesley is actually telling him, hey, you have to go back into the school now. One of his main concerns based off our conversations is, is it safe? I mean, the vaccines are here, but if people don't get vaccinated or if they choose not to get vaccinated, how is that going to affect him? So those type of questions that he has, I really don't have answers for him because I have the same questions and I don't have answers myself. Um, so, so Serenity, is yeah. there any way we can uh, assist Kina and myself? Uh, what, what do we say to our children in the midst of this if they're not safe to go back? Because they got to go back at some point. Any, any suggestions? I think, um, uh, Kina, by the way, my name is Leah. Kina, my name is Larry, and I serve as the clinical director here at Serenity. And I think the first thing is to be honest with your son and acknowledge that you don't have the answers just like he doesn't have the answers, like most of the community doesn't have the answers. And we're trying to figure this out as we go along. And I think recognizing that we're all in uncharted territory and everything that we're doing is a good place to start. It's not a great place, but it's an honest place to start. And I think that's, the, I think that's an important first step in working with your son about addressing safety issues, and then talking about what you guys need to do and what he needs to do to be safe for himself. These are the things you wear a mask when you do this. You take plenty of hand sanitizer to do this. You watch your space when you're doing this. Um, so paying attention to all of that in the process is important for him as he's going into school and then for you when he comes home from school at the end of the day, once he does go back to in-person learning. Mm -hmm. Any, any questions, um, Kina, uh, what, and, and since you're, on the one, you're the only one on the call, um, let's just step away from the pandemic. We're talking about parenting questions in general. You know, I, I've had a chance to, you, you, you and Wesley had an opportunity to be a part of Next Level for the past few weeks now. You have experts on the call, uh, on, this, on this call right now. Any questions that you have from them uh, as it relates to parenting, a young man in the midst of um, not just a pandemic, but just life in general? Yes. Um, so how do you as a mom, you know, well, how can I say this? As a mom, you're supposed to be warm and nurturing and loving and all of that, right? But when there's an absent father in the home, you have to bring in the discipline, you have to bring in a certain tough, uh, skill to the table when you're parenting what is a good way to balance that because i'm finding that as he gets older there are certain things that he doesn't want to talk to me about there are certain things that he's going through and he's very naturally private anyway so it's like pulling teeth to get answers to kind of find out where his mental is he's not really big on communication he's kind of an introverted kid so as a mom, you know, the nurturing side of me is like, hey, what's going on? Let's communicate. But the tough that I have to put on is, okay, he got to work it out. He got to figure it out. As a man, he has to learn and figure it out and go through those things. So what is a good, healthy balance? Because I don't want to go into the nagging mom because that's never fun. 
mm-hmm. and you also don't want to go into the overbearing woman because I am going to be the role or who he looks to when it comes to him dating, getting a wife and all of that. And I don't want him to bring me an ag- aggressive daughter-in-law. <laughs> like, that's not what I want. So how do you find a balance with that? Let me ask uh, Ms. Tanji. Did you want to <laughs> contribute to that to that question? I know we kind of had a similar conversation the other day. Ms. Tanji is another one. I, I, I'm sorry, y'all, I missed the introductions. But Ms. Tanji is another one of of our great mental health professionals that works at Serenity, Serenity Community Services. She's one of our group facilitators. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for allowing me to talk um, and to make comment. I was smiling because this is the age-old question that single mothers have who are raising males. How do I find the balance? Well, first of all, I'll just take a breath and breathe because finding the balance, it will happen when they are grown. (laughs) And you'll look back and say, hey, okay, Um, I did pretty well. Um, Just this personal reflection, two uh, sons uh, on my own, meaning that their father was not absent, but deceased. And um, having to raise them, I instantly realized that, am I raising them to be a woman? or am, I'm raising them to be men. So uh, being a uh, quote unquote strong black woman, um, but with wisdom, uh, understanding that they had to have an example of what manhood looked like. So instantly when my youngest son was in the pre-K, I started a um, group of uh, people in the community, uh, barbers, uh, professionals who were men, and mentors so that they can see a tangible example of what a a man looked like. And I maintained my role as the nurturing mom. Yes, I had to be stern uh, many times. Yes, I had to uh, have some pretty rigid parameters, but I gave myself a break and I attended to the role that I was made to be, which was mom. So the balance comes when you just embrace that you are a mother, you are nurturing. Uh, you are supposed to be the nurturer. You are the one who are, is setting the tone for values and to allow them to understand what your role is and to uh, be able to feel comfortable in coming to you for what they need. Uh, oftentimes we uh, say that we got to be a man. No, we, you can't be a man, uh, you know, in this society you probably could, but if you uh, have not had, you know, those changes, uh, in your body uh, physically, medically, uh, and you are embracing being um, a woman, your gender, then you have to embrace that. Uh, And so the balance comes when you give yourself a break and you take a breath and you have the aha moment of, I'm gonna be the best mother that I can be. I'm gonna provide tangible examples of a mentorship or mentors uh, for my sons. And I'm gonna play and stay in my role. Yes, you're going to be the strong disciplinarian. Yes, you're going to set uh, a parameters as to what you want them to do in terms of discipline, in terms of guidelines. But you're not going to try to be the man uh, in their life uh, in terms of uh, outside of the gender role. And, and it, it comes um, with a lot of wisdom. It comes with a lot of time. But, you know, you, you, you tell them, I'm your mother. And I'm here to, uh, you know, raise you to be, uh, good uh, human beings, uh, but we're going to, you know, try to bring in some other people. Maybe you have uh, a positive role model in your uh, support system, whether that could be a, a family member or someone, if you, you know, whatever your faith is uh, at your church, uh, somebody who they can kind of bounce those male, male things off um, to questions they don't want to ask you. And, I, and I'm going to um, try to wrap it up. Uh, my son, my eldest son, uh, when he was younger, uh, he, you know, he was a, a 4.0 student. He was a well mannered young man, did, didn't give me any problems. So I thought, wow, this is, this is going pretty well. Well, when he turned 14, he told me I want to uh, go to the Steve Harvey Mentors Weekend. I thought, okay, what do you want to go there for? Uh, well, they have mentors. So I didn't realize, and, and he had applied out of 5,000 people. He was selected. We went. So I'm thinking mentor. No, this is for us. Uh, this is for young men who had problems, who had issues, and they were selected because of that. And so 
long story short, what I gained from Ayana Zazant was embrace my role as mom, embrace my role as mother, and allow mistakes to happen. Give myself a break. And uh, me being the one who had to, uh, still is learning to release control, had to embrace the fact that, you know, it's not going to be perfect. But certain parameters, certain dip- discipline uh, strategies, certain things you're going to allow to happen in your house, um, they're going to follow. But I guess that the thing I want you to uh, take away from this is to give yourself a break, breathe, and to uh, trust the process as to your discipline and embrace being a mom. I hope that helps. <laughs> yes, it helps a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, thank you, Miss Ta- Ta- Tanji. Uh, Tanji. Anybody else yeah. want to uh, chime on that? Because um, you know, Miss M- 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 Ponderite, although you wasn't a uh, single mother, but you uh, had the privilege and the honor of uh, raising two uh, astute, distinguished African American male uh, young men. What what was your strategy? What what was the key for you? to getting Joseph and Joshua to where they are today? It's a lot of of what Tanji said. Um, Number one, you have to release yourself from trying to be a man and raising a man. We know how to raise a girl to be a girl or a woman because we are women. But we don't know how to raise a man, uh, a young man to be a man because we don't know what they go through. We can provide, be a provider for them and be a nurturer for them, but you know, when it's all said and done, they really need another male figure in their life for some things that we can't handle. And being connected to Coach Davis, Next Level Boys Academy is a great step. I'm, I'm glad to see you're here because I know he will get that mentorship and other opportunities where he can get mentorship. And one of the most important things you said, Ms. Phillips, was that he talked to you and he said something to you when you were talking to him. So meet him where he is. On the moments where he is talking, if he's in there in front of that video game, but you know, that's his safe place. And you can sit down and engage him in some side talk. You'll be surprised at how much information you'll get. And you'll also be surprised at how freely he gives it. See what I'm saying? So yeah, I I I won't belabor the point, but I think Tanji, what Tanji said was exactly where you need to go. So, uh, Serenity, if y'all can, uh, anybody, uh, DJ, since your first your first time on here, man, I'm gonna go ahead and use you for a second. Um, just, just what are, what are some of the things, man, you've heard from parents, uh, from families you're working with that that's been their challenges during this pandemic, and what were your suggestions or recommendations uh, with those questions? Well, um, some of my uh, teenage parents have some of the same concerns. They're single parents. And um, in addition to what some of the ladies have just said, what I always tell them is you need definitely need these two things. You need consistency and stability. You have to have those two things because whether they're, you know, males or, or females and if it's in, in these single parent type homes, if you don't have boundaries and baselines set and you're just all over the place, they see that and they feed off of that. So as a parent, you have to set those boundaries and be consistent with whatever you're doing, um, schedules, um, expectations, and sticking to those things. Are, are things gonna fall off a little bit sometimes? Yes, nothing's ever gonna be perfect, but you as the adults are still in the place of being role models. You're being role models to your children, even though they're your children, they're still looking up to you. So they're watching what you're doing. They're watching what you're saying. They're watching who you are entertaining, where you're going. And even as far as the pandemic is concerned, we know that they're gonna end up going back into the schools, right? So why wait until that time comes to do what's what's gonna be expected of them? So you're washing the hands, wearing the mask now, when you leave the home, because we already know the city's open back up. So even though the kids are not in school, guess what? Mom is taking them to Walmart. She's taking them to Sam's Club. She's taking them to McDonald's. You know, they're all still all over the city, but these practices 
need to be in place now so that you can eliminate some of the fear. So I always tell them, don't just wait until school opens back up. Expect that they do their homework now. You as the parent, check the homework, go over it, help them, and provide whatever support you can for them right now while they're at home. Because these times when they're at home right now, they're very critical. These are relationship type building moments that they cannot get at school. These are critical moments. Bond, bond with your son, talk to him, whether good or bad, and don't necessarily judge him, but listen to him. Be empathetic to what he might be feeling. And I just try to have those open dialogues with them and say, just be consistent with what you're doing. If you expect him to take out the trash every night before he goes to bed, make him do it. You know, don't let him slide. You know, you know, DJ, uh, you, you guys are great, man, to have, uh, you know, y'all answer these questions so well to have the boss's boss, the boss's boss boss on this call, man. But, you know, what, what I've learned over the years um, is, one of the hardest things to do as a parent is to parent when you're not in a good place in your own personal life, right? So I think a lot of times with these kids, man, they, a lot of times with these people, with these kids is that the challenges, the struggles that adults have in their personal lives is rolling over into how they parent, right? So if anybody can talk about uh, I just see Shabazz just looking at me like he didn't quite understand what I said. So Shabazz, what I was saying was, we often hear about what the child is not doing. But when the question goes back to how are you doing? Or I'm not good, I'm not doing well. Uh, April, if you could just expound on that and see how important is that? Um, that you be together as a parent uh, uh, because that's going to affect your child at some point, agree? Absolutely. Um, yes, it is. Uh, I, I personally have two daughters that are school age, that are um, out of school, they're at home, um, and they see, they see us. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to be transparent. Like Larry said before, these are uncharted times, so we all are just trying to figure it out. And I think it's okay to let them know just that, but it's going to be okay. Um, so for me, I'm learning to figure out what self-care looks like in a pandemic, being a parent, yeah. trying to figure out how to support these kids, being a teacher. I feel like we have so many hats and that is kind of the pressure right now. But I feel like as long as you're being open to letting them know that, hey, we're trying, hey, we'll figure it out together. That's kind of what has to seem to work in my house. Um, I'm not a single mother, but I definitely do have girls that kind of look to me um, to kind of, you know, hey, what are we doing? Um, I'm missing this, I'm missing that. And I just let them know you're missing this or you're missing that, but we're alive and we're doing okay. So um, right now, that's what's the most important thing. And, that, and, that, and I'm, I'm assuming that's for all the people who are somewhat okay financially. What about the people that's trying to parent in the midst of a financial struggle or no type of support system? What do we do with that? I mean, that that's let's be realistic about it because you know, it's people lost their jobs, people are, you got uneducated people being educators. And, you know, it's just, it's just a big mess, man. So I want you guys to help us grown folk for a minute. Um, give us some ways that we could balance our lives. That's not very, very cost, you know, that's cost effective. That, that, that doesn't cost a lot of money because our kids are not right until we're right. We're okay, right? So y'all have any tips, any, any ideas, any, any, anything that we can do that's, you know, that we can afford that can just give us some type of balance as parents? Well, it's a couple. You can go. Well, it's a couple of different strategies. Uh, like I could just give like a couple of small things that you can do immediately that can kind of, if we're talking about how to make yourself feel better, trying to balance yourself out so you can, you know, parent a little better. It's like, it's small things. You can, you can try uh, meditation or there's things like, you know, taking, taking deep breaths, you know, stretching. Try, if you start to try to take care of your body more, try to be a little bit more physically, uh, try to be a bit, <clears throat> try to exercise a little more. That, that helps your mental as well. 
um, you know, getting, trying to, you know, increase your sleep, try to sleep more. Uh, obviously, avoid excessive alcohol, you know, and tobacco and, and, and you know, and, and substances and things like that because that helps keep you uh, down instead of pick you up. You mean to we got to parent kids and not drink and smoke? <laughs> no, nah, well, you know, no, no, no. I'm just saying. You definitely have know, a drink if you need it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. But, you know, in moderation, everything's good in moderation. It's, uh, you know, making even the sure communion, you take, even, even the communion. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, just, just making the time to unwind, you know, trying to make sure that you, you know, you get on calls like this to connect with others, to hear how everybody else is also going through. It's, it's sometimes, you know, things can get worse and we'll, we'll get a little bit more hard on ourselves feeling like we're the only person going through it. But once you get, you know, if you can tap into resources like these or tap into agencies, you know, like Next Level or, or Serenity Community Services, where we can kind of help you to navigate some of these different uh, issues and triggers that, you know, that are going to arise. So, yeah, I think, I think no, those are small things. I think somebody else is about to chime in. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, if I could um, jump in with the first thing in the morning um, that I do for self-care is to uh, affirmations. Um, and basically there's just statements, you know, about a positive, I am statements, you know, I am alive, you know, I am grateful. I'm, you know, I am thankful. I am capable. I am worthy. And I'll begin with those statements. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I am, um, a Christian. So I, I say, I'm a child of God, whatever your faith is, but just affirming before I even, uh, get out of the bed fully. Uh, just, you know, processing with uh, myself uh, so that I can just affirm my day. And then, um, you know, throughout the day, you know, repeating those statements, you know, uh, repeating, uh, you know, affirmations to yourself when you're stressed, when you're facing something that you uh, are encountering maybe on your job, and then um, ending the day the same way. You know, eventually, you know, those things are going to manifest. You know, you start speaking those words, you know, speak life to your situation and you start affirming uh, positive things uh, over your life, then it's going to ultimately manifest. It's like planting a seed. Whatever you plant in the ground is going to come up. Either it's going to be a flower or it's going to be a weed. But the bottom line is what you put in, you're going to get out. So if you put positive affirmations in the morning throughout the day and close it uh with something positive uh in in terms of affirmation um then that's a positive step for self-care and if i can yeah. jump in and pick it back off what she just said Tanja just said do that in front of your children oh my god that's teach what them to how to speak positive and build themselves and teach them how to decrease their anxieties by positive affirmations and stuff like that. It's almost like positive self-talk, which negates some of the negative talks that is automatic, automatic in what we do every day, is we have thousands of negative thoughts going through our mind. So we have to purposely put in the good positive thoughts. And so if they see you doing that, they're more likely to do it. So when they're scared to walk in that school because you've already been to the school, you've already taught them how to wear their mask, You've already got them used to wearing the mask for a certain amount of hours. You see them with their peers with their mask. You enforce that they got to tell their mask when they're with their peers, even though they feel very comfortable. When you go to that school and they walk in that school, they start speaking those positive affirmations, even if they're a little afraid. They will do that on their own. And it's a good thing for you to teach them for lifelong skills to learn. And yeah, so yeah, and that's for and that's for everybody who had kids in the nineties. What about these folks that got these kids that was born in two thousand ten and two thousand eight? So Keena, you can you hear Wesley sitting back sit down, listen to you read your affirmations every every morning and all this and good you, stuff? Well, I, think I do participate. I you know, I have, I'm not a mother, but I do have godchildren who are listening. And all my godchildren were born in the 2000s. And, you know, they come to my it girl, April's uh, daughters. We love them. And they do participate. If you teach them, they will do it. I think one of the, I just want to piggyback on yes. self-care. They do, don't they? Oh, there's Miss Aisha, are you here? We can hear you. 
No, I muted. Go ahead, Nina. Oh, you muted her. Um, one that even my uh, youngest goddaughter, I've taught her about that. And I think when it comes to self care, you have to make a list of what you need. What do I need? And start checking those things off. If it's personally, what do I need? If I need, you know, two thousand dollars, how can I obtain that? If I need food, how can I do that? And if I need to get my body back in shape. How can I do that to make myself feel the best in this time? And it's okay for during a pandemic to be selfish. I'm going to say that to everybody. It is okay to be selfish and get what you need during this time. So, Okay. Be selfish. Be <laughs> selfish, parents. Just don't get a defense case, but be selfish. <laughs> um, we had a, uh, I think there was a question uh, in it. Hold on, Keena. There was a question in the comment section. I think somebody put it here. What was the question? Yeah, they, they, we it's a question, and it was put by uh, Vivian Hicks, and she says, suppose they won't talk and you don't have a male figure to help. Vivian, Vivian Hicks, is that Daniel's mom? That's Vivian? Daniel, yes, yes. And you know, she's raising Daniel as a single parent as well. Well, well we're just going to, we'll just say this real quick. Uh, Vivian, I'm still in the same place I've been for 10 years. And, uh, and and Daniel has been here since he was a little bitty boy, and we're still here. So if if we're here, we're here, we're here. You have my personal number, you have uh, my social security number, you have all that. So just reach out. But in reference to a young man not talking, um, <laughs> that's normal. Um, sometimes when when you've done all the talking for them all their life, they may not even know what to say at this stage. Uh, they don't know how to speak for themselves because every time they act up at the school, you're there cussing the principal and the teacher out. Not you, Vivian, but I'm just hypothetically speaking. So when a young man doesn't talk, it, uh, it can mean multiple things. Just in my experience of talk, uh, working with young men is uh, maybe they don't have nothing to talk about. And, and, and I, think, I think one of the things, Melanie, that I believe a, a lot of people are in denial about, I know I was and I, I'm still in denial, that our kids really think that we're old, right? They think that we're old. They, they, they think that we don't know anything. They think that, you know, it's not really cool to talk to, you know, your parents. And let me say this, and I'll, I'll let you guys chime in about why young men don't talk. I'll say this time and time again, it is, it is not okay to be your child's friend but it is okay to be friendly with your child. There's a very big difference because you cannot raise your friend. And if you try to befriend your child and then try to raise them, it's going to backfire on you. Doesn't mean that you don't, you have to be frowned and all stuffy all the time. But listen, you got to be very, very careful when it comes to, um, you know, being friendly and being friends with the children. But well, Serena, I want to hear from you guys, man. Why? What? What are some of the things that? What are some of the reasons why y'all think young men don't talk? I don't fear. Know. Fear. Not being heard. You said fear, DJ. Ahead, DJ. Yeah. I, I, one of the I found that one of the reasons is because a lot of times they fear that they're going to say the wrong thing, or what they say is going to be judged incorrectly, so they will shut down or not respond. Um, because in, in many cases, they've been chastised a lot. And so they would just shut down, you know, go into this shutdown mode. I'm not going to say anything because either way, I'm going to get fussed at or either way, I'm going to get in trouble. So they won't say anything. Now, that doesn't make it right. But I have found over the years, that's a major reason why, especially boys, they'll just shut down. You can look right at them and ask them, why, why did you do this? Or why did you say that? And they won't respond because, because they're already fearful of what a consequence is gonna be. Yeah, and, and I agree with you, uh, Derek. One of the uh, comments that are on Facebook, they said from Honey Lander, she said, include the children in self-care, decompress together, work out together, let them lead or come up with ideas of how to spend at least 30 minutes at the end of the day. Those are great suggestions. Absolutely. I appreciate Honey Landers for making those suggestions. And I agree with what Derry says. A lot of times when they shut down and they don't talk, it's because they are afraid. And I will say this, and for single parents, do a self-assessment. And I know this might be difficult, but do a self-assessment and say, 
and I let some of the little stuff go, okay? I had to do that with, with my children. And uh, some of the little stuff was them wearing locks. It was their hair. And right. but my husband was in the military. And so, but my feeling was is if they want to do that, look, they ain't out stealing, killing, they ain't doing, they ain't dropping out of school, it's their hair. It's okay. Let them have that self-expression. Fear is a big motivator for a lot of things. And therefore, if we overreact about everything, then they are going to shut down. But if we meet them in the place where they are, they're going to open up and talk to us. And we can just lose our way in there by having a moment with them or some together time or something like that. And they're talking to us. And I can bet you, and, and, and piggyback to what Ms. Ponder Wright said, I can bet you the, the, this long string of hair on my head. If you ever get in a power struggle with your son, you're not going to win. Uh, you got to pick, and I think Ms. Ponder Wright knows this better than anybody, you got to pick and choose your battles with them. And if you wake up in the morning time and the dishes are dirty and the trash need to be taken out and the bed messed up and the face need washed, if you try to pick all five of them things with them, you're probably going to create uh, an argument. So, and, 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 and think about this. <laughs> Ms. Ponder Wright, at what age was Joshua when you, the last time you said to him, don't forget to brush your teeth. Did you brush your teeth? Did you wash your face? Isn't it shocking, Ms. Ponder Wright, that you find yourself, probably didn't do this with your daughter, but with, young, with your sons, you find yourself telling them the same thing from age five all the way up to 14. Can I get an amen? Well, <laughs> and you yeah, want, yeah. And, and they you want to get it. There would have been to get it, but you got to understand, I had to learn the hard way. You go to school with your face dirty, and once your, your classmate tell you your face dirty, your breast stink, or you musty, or that girl tell you that she liked to, you know, she liked the boys that wear the, uh, what you call a little spray. Listen, parenting is hard for everybody, man. It, it is, and especially this generation. Uh, for those of you all, I think, uh, 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 um, I've seen her, I, I, Aisha. Uh, I'm sure she has smaller kids. I'm sure that her perception of this parent in the pandemic will be totally different from Kina, who has a, 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 a you know a teenager. So uh, Aisha, if you don't mind, uh, and I'm assuming this, you work with Serenity. Are you with Serenity? Yes, I do. How old are your children? Now let's get down to the, this. This is the population I work with. How old are your children? I have a 14 year old, a 13 year old, a 10 year old, and a um, two year old. And and Mr. Joseph Wright said that it's very not it's not good to drink or smoke while you're parenting. And uh, so I want to know what are your strategies? Um, how has this parenting the pandemic been for you? Because you got three, you're teaching three kids at home, correct? on different grade levels? Well, my oldest three, they pretty much know what to do and how to do it. And my youngest one, she's in daycare. So it's not really hard. I mean, it's just, just the same routine as I always been had. Just, um, just making sure they stay on top of their work and just come home to, I mean, just pretty much the same thing to kids being kids. I remember your 14 year old, ninth grade? Yeah, no, she's an eighth. Hey, I remember when my child was in the eighth and ninth grade, and they asked me how to do math, and I didn't know how to do it. I was so oh, embarrassed. Oh, yeah, that's my worst yeah, subject. Yeah, yeah. You ever went through that? You ever went through that? I was so ashamed. I mean, I had all these degrees, and I didn't even know what two <laughs> squares times 18 square and all this other stuff. But uh, but listen, if you're, if, you're, if you're doing it well, Aisha, kudos to you. Uh, there's a lot of people out here that's having a difficult time. Keena, the general said that we need to be off by seven. Do you have a question? I saw your hand up earlier, Keena. Um, I forgot the question. It's okay. okay. Gary? Uh, yes, sir. One of the, I was talking about why boys don't talk. One of the things I wanted to bring up is that we as men are taught not to talk about our feelings. We as men are, told, are taught not to talk about what's going on, that we suck it up and are strong with it and deal with it from there. And I think that is a big thing that 
as a society and as a culture that we have to work through. And one of the things that I think is beneficial to having a strong woman in their lives who is able to talk about things is that teaches boys and young men that they can talk about things and talking about things that are bothering them is not the end of the world. But I think this is definitely an issue when raising, when men, little boys are out wandering around and talking with their friends, you just don't talk about what's going on in your life. And, it's and boys, when, and, and Larry, you ever hear about uh, <laughs> when boys fall on the playground, they say, hey man, toughen up, boys don't cry. Yes. And when the girl and the girl fall, you call a helicopter, the ambulance, give her 13 <laughs> bad days and some <laughs> alcohol. So you think you think that plays a role of how they show their emotions the older they get, Larry? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. It's definitely a piece of that, yes. So yes. for these and people out here with the these things. so for these uh parents out here with these two or three year olds that's at, that's playing at the park at Welcome All, they fall and scrape their knee, the little boy. Is it okay for him to cry and express how his knee hurts? Yes. <laughs> and that's the part we as parents have to reinforce with our kids that if it hurts, talk about it. If it hurts, cry. It is okay to cry. Um, and, I, and that is a real controversial conversation and a controversial behavior to have for a man to cry, for a little boy to cry about something that's hurting, physically, emotionally, or whatever. What about if, it's, if he's hurting about his dad not being in the home and haven't been given that space to cry? How important is that, Larry? That is, re I mean, just as important as everything else. That's what we're talking about. It's because we are taught not to talk about things. And so we have to have that space to be able to open up and share what's going on inside. Well, and I also believe that there's a balance because as a dating woman, there's nothing worse than some a man who is super, super duper sensitive. Um, in my perspective, from my perspective, I'm just being honest, you know, I, I haven't been out with some men. And I'm like, now listen now, you can't be crying about everything. But <laughs> because women are really strong as well. So I think that if we teach our kids younger, like my God kids, I brought them into therapy and they needed it, you know. And I think if we teach our kids younger about healthy skills of communication, that you don't necessarily have to cry and or throw a tantrum tantrum and or fight somebody and or go out and uh, get a gun and shoot somebody. But what is healthy? What is the balance that I think that that helps it going on along with what Larry said and what, um, you know, Aisha said and, and Ms. Keena said, because it's so important that we teach everybody a balance um, and therapy helps. And it, it shouldn't be something that you learn when you're in a, a in a, a in a doozy, but it should be something that you are actively putting in. It's like exercise. Exercise that muscle, you'll learn it. You'll have that muscle memory. So you know how to communicate in, in relationships, both men and women. And unfortunately, the guy that you dated is oversensitive. He didn't get a chance to crowd the playground, um, you know, whenever you hurt his knee. Uh -huh. Hopefully, you see somebody that got a chance to express how he felt on the playground. Uh -huh. Hey, Joseph, it sounds like uh, the general has taken our time away, man. If you, want, if you want to close this out, I mean, because if it's on Facebook, you know, you got to understand it takes people 45 minutes just for it to circle around with, with 5,000 people. But, hey, listen, I got to follow the rules, Joe. So you want to close this out and get us out of here, man? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, yeah, man, just, again, thank everybody for, for taking the time to hop on the call. The overall mission, the overall goal behind having these calls is to, like I said in the beginning, A, provide a resource to the community because we know that this is a tough time, but also we want to bring that knowledge, the knowledge that we understand, the power that we feel when we're taking care of our mental health. We want to spread that to, to the community of a whole, as a, in a whole. So, you know, we had the change in the narrative campaign. It's all about changing the narrative associated with, with, with mental and behavioral health services, period, with, with getting these type of services, with getting therapy, with getting case management. We're trying to bring, you know, we want to bring more attention to that in uh, not only minority communities, but specifically minority communities. So <laughs> if that makes sense. So basically, you know, that, that, that's, that's really the whole purpose of why we came up with the call. And, uh, you know, we want to embrace our mental health. We want to take care of our mental health and we want to give as many resources as we can. I wish we could have had Miss Aisha talk briefly because I know we talked about uh, something with her raising young men the other day, but we can say that for the next call. 
We can say that for Absolutely. Me. And I'd like to thank everybody who logged on, tuned in. Please share this video with other people. Let them know that we're going to be here once a month. Serenity Community Services, a behavior and mental health agency located in Union City, Georgia. We have the address. It's going to be in the comments. We'll put all the contact information right there. Questions, bring the questions with you. Um, and ask us and we'll do our best to give you some very simple ways to handle that situation so we appreciate everybody for logging on and hopefully thank you so much uh, and joseph how often joseph you could tell our viewers how often that we have these calls and yes sir so yeah once a month so you know we might you know we might talk about uh kicking it up but right now it's once a month um, you can find find us on uh, Facebook at Serenity Community Services, Instagram at Serenity uh, C O M S V C S, Twitter at Serenity C O M S V C S, and uh, you know of course always call us at seven seven zero eight nine two three two zero zero. And I know all of that information is going to be dropped in the box. And again, I just want to you know thank everybody for hopping on. Let's just continue to change that narrative and keep you know pushing, pushing this, this mental health narrative into our communities, man, and just keep talking about these resources and let's keep this thing going. Seven o'clock, guys, y'all have a good night. Bye, General, oh. bye, Melody. Oh. I did good, I'm out. Thank you, <laughs> Gary, thank you. All right. Bye, y'all. Right. Bye.